streaming. Uh, now I have to find this. Okay, that's live. Good connection. Uh, okay, so. That's not working. Uh, let's see. Can someone check and see whether or not if they go to the yes, YouTube? Yes, it's. I can see the slides. I can see the oh, slides on YouTube. Very good. All right. We're good. Okay, let me get back to Zoom. And, okay, very good. Okay. So... Uh, are, are we ready? I want to do my little introduction and then Simon, you can do the, you can do the intro, uh, intro, introduce, uh, Brent. How's that? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> uh, hello everyone. This is Robert Bryant, who, uh, I'm the director of the Simons collaboration, and I'm happy to welcome you to this, our January workshop of the Simons collaboration on special holonomy and geometry analysis and physics. Uh, entitled Donald, Donaldson Thomas Invariance and Resurgence. And uh, uh, a couple of things to say. Uh, one is that when you're not speaking, please, uh, uh, please stay mute. I will actually mute everybody after, uh, after uh, uh, Simon, after uh, uh, Brent begins. And, but uh, but if you want to ask a question, you should unmute your mic and uh, and uh, raise your hand uh, to let uh, to let Brent know that you have a question. Uh, and the live streaming should be working now. Everybody should be able to see that. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the Simons Foundation for the Simons Foundation support of the conference. Uh, let's see. Oh, and. Uh, those of you who are speakers uh, will ask you uh, when you before you start speaking to uh, to put the URL for your slides in the chat so that people can download them and follow along on the slides uh, and make notes on the slides if they want to. Uh, and in any case, we want to be able to post the slides uh, once the uh, you know once the conference is over, along with the the videos and. Let me go ahead and uh, uh, thank you for your uh, thank you for being here. And I'm now going to start the recording. Okay, and uh, and I will introduce uh, Simon Solomon, who is one of the three organizers of this workshop. Simon. Uh, Dominic Joyce and Sakura uh, Sheffer Nameki uh, are the organizers, and uh, and Simon will introduce our first speaker. Uh, so Simon, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks, Robert. So I've got an easy job. The title's on screen, um, and so it's a pleasure to have uh, Brent Pym from McGill talking on the Stokes phenomenon and. Resurgence, we have an hour slot for this and then we have question time and so on. Okay, so over to you, Brent. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this workshop. Um, it's, a, it's a topic which I've been admiring somewhat afar from for a long time now. Uh, Brent, you need to... Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so I, I was okay. saying I'm, I've been admiring the subject from afar for some time. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have a chance to, uh, to be at this workshop. Um, so I was asked to give a, a general background lecture about the Stokes phenomenon and resurgence. So that's the plan. It's a purely expository talk. I won't be saying uh, anything original. Uh, but I guess the idea is to, uh, to give some background, which will hopefully uh, help everyone to digest uh, what, what's coming. All right. So um, in brief, uh, what is the Stokes phenomenon? Well, it's the observation, which goes back to Stokes uh, some time ago, that uh, uh, 
you know, we like it when a power series converges and defines a function, but even when a power series diverges, it can still actually be a very useful tool as an approximation for our function in the sense of asymptotic expansions. And uh, a key thing which she observed in studying the ARI function was that these kinds of asymptotic expansions, they have a kind of directionality to them. So um, more precisely, if you, if you have a function and you try to approximate it by such a divergent asymptotic series, then what typically happens is that your series will work well in uh, certain regions in the complex plane, uh, certain sectors, but then uh, as you move along, you maybe cross a ray in the complex plane and suddenly the asymptotics of the function, they jump in a discrete fashion um, by some exponentially small corrections. And, uh, and that is the Stokes phenomenon, it's this kind of discontinuity in the asymptotics of, uh, of functions near a singular point. And uh, as for resurgence, well, this is a maybe an even deeper insight, which is that these types of divergent series expansions, they can often actually be resummed in a way to produce an honest function. Um, so this goes back to uh, the work of Emile Borel at the turn of the 20th century. And it was really turned into a uh, systematic theory of resurgence by Cal in the 80s. Um, so as I said, it's a, it's a method for taking certain divergent power series and resumming them in order to get an honest function. And uh, it, it accounts for all of these exponentially small corrections. And the really amazing output of this resurgence theory is that uh, you can take a certain series, resum them, and what you get is uh, somehow the correct answer for the sum of the series. Maybe, maybe you have a physics problem, like a, a problem in quantum field theory, you, you write a perturbative expansion, and you want to find the true value of this number that you're trying to calculate. Uh, well, the, it seems that in many cases, this, uh, this approach to resumming the series really does give you the non-perturbatively correct answer. Um, so th these are the things which I want to sketch today. And it's going to be a very, uh, very sketchy overview, uh, as I said, just in preparation for the other talks. Um, if you want more details, uh, I did teach a course about this uh, about five years ago in Oxford, a uh, very short course, uh, which was mostly for me to learn the topic myself. And um, there you'll find uh, some references, which I found helpful at the time. And also my, uh, my personal lecture notes, which I should say are, are sketchy and unedited. So they should be taken with a grain of salt, but perhaps uh, you may find them useful. Okay. So uh, as an entry point to the subject, uh, many authors have found it useful to, uh, to explore a very simple example. So that's what I'd like to begin with. The example is, is an ordinary differential equation for a function f of a variable x, very simple equation. So x squared times dF dx is equal to x minus f. This is called Euler's equation. So uh, I just want to go about solving this, uh, this ODE. And uh, I'm just going to do it in a completely brute force fashion. So I'm going to start by uh, you know, trying to find a, a power series solution in the usual way. So I, I have the coefficients of the power series as unknowns and I stick this into the ODE and I'm gonna solve it. Okay, so uh, the first thing to observe is that uh, in this ODE, uh, two of the terms have a factor of X. So uh, those terms vanish when X is equal to zero. So that means that F would have to also, if it was gonna be a, say a smooth solution of this equation. So we may as well start with a power series that has no constant term. So the only power is x to the n plus one. Okay. And now I stick this into the, uh, into the ODE and I start solving. And the first thing I find out is that the leading coefficient has to be equal to one. And that's because uh, the, this term here vanishes to order two, but the other one only vanishes to order one. So we have to match the, uh, match the coefficient. And then uh, from then on, I get a kind of recurrence relation, which says that the nth coefficient is minus n times the previous one. So that's a recurrence, which we can all solve very easily. And it gives us the series uh, whose coefficients are minus one to the power n times n factorial. 
And now this, uh, this answer presents us with two problems. The first one you're primed for, because I've already mentioned it, it's a divergent series. So um, you just apply the usual ratio test. You see that the coefficients are growing too rapidly. The radius of convergence of this power series is equal to zero. But there's a second, uh, second problem, which is that we all know if you solve an ODE, there ought to be a parameter, a constant of integration. And actually you see here, the coefficients were uniquely determined. So where's the constant of integration? It's absent. Um, and some other, the cause of these problems is the fact that this uh, differential equation, although it looks nice and smooth the way I've written it, it actually has a singularity at x equals zero. Because remember when you, when you write an ODE, you're always supposed to isolate for the derivative. So I should really write the equation in this form, df dx is one over x minus f over x squared, just dividing through by x squared. Okay, so actually this is a singular ODE and the usual existence uniqueness theorem breaks down at x equals zero. Okay, so to deal with this issue about the constant integration, well, um, let's pretend for the moment that this uh, power series we found counts as a solution of the equation. Well, then, as we know, any other solution of this inhomogeneous equation should be given by a solution of the corresponding homogeneous equation. So that means I kill off this one over x term and I get a simpler equation, df tilde dx is minus f tilde over x squared. And now um, I solve that equation, very easy to integrate. Uh, I get f tilde is a constant, there's my constant of integration, times the exponential of one over x. Now this is very much not an analytic function. So you're starting to see the problem at x equals zero. Uh, anyway, what you sort of expect is that the general solution of this equation should have the following form. It should be some function corresponding to this uh, power series that we found. And then uh, the remaining solution should be given by taking that one solution and adding to it uh, the function one over or each of the one over x times a constant. So that gives me all these, uh, these blue curves, which are, uh, or shifts of this, uh, this red function by this essential singularity. And a uh, key thing to observe is that uh, the asymptotics of this function, of the solutions, they're, they're quite different depending on whether we look uh, on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. So for positive x, e to the one over x is blowing up very rapidly as x goes to zero. So all of these solutions are uh, departing from one another. And on the left-hand side, uh, what's happening is that uh, each of the one over x is uh, going to uh, zero very, very rapidly. So all of these uh, solutions, they're uh, asymptotic to one another. Okay, so, so now what I want to do is explain how to take this divergent series solution that we have and try to coax it into an actual solution of the equation. And so this is the method of Borel summation and it rests on a very standard identity, which you may maybe saw in uh, an ODE's course, which is an identity for the Laplace transform. So uh, it says that uh, this uh, expression n factorial x to the n plus one is actually the Laplace transform of the monomial t to the power n um, here, uh, maybe you're used to seeing uh, the Laplace transform as e to the minus t times s. So for me, s is one over x. But anyway, this is the Laplace transform of this function t to the n. So now I just take this identity and I substitute it into my, uh, my series. So I start with the function, uh, the series f. And now I replace this n factorial x to the n plus one with this Laplace transform. And now I do something illegal, which is, uh, well, it's a divergent series, so uh, I shouldn't be able to interchange the order of summation and integration, but let me just go ahead and do it. What happens then is that I get inside of this series something simpler, which is a geometric series. And then I can sum that up and I get one over one plus T. Now, the minor issue here is that this uh, geometric series, it only converges when the absolute value of t is less than one. 
But anyways, we know it has a unique analytic continuation to uh, the whole complex plane, except the whole, and t equals minus one. So uh, in that way, I can somehow uh, turn this uh, divergent series into an expression. And now everything in this expression makes good sense because I have a function uh, which is integrable from zero to infinity. And so this defines for me a function which is closely related to the classical exponential integral function. And uh, the key thing is that this function, um, it is actually a solution of the ODE. So to see that you just take this uh, function of X and differentiate under the integral sign and you'll see that it solves Euler's equation. And, uh, and moreover, it is closely related to our, uh, our original series in a very precise sense. So um, if I truncate the series at some order, big N, then this function is very well approximated by that, uh, that Taylor polynomial in the usual way. So it's uh, equal to that uh, polynomial modulo a term of order, uh, sorry, that should have been a big N plus one as X goes to zero. So it's an asymptotic expansion. Are there any questions so far? I have a quick question. Uh, what was the meaning of the graph when you had a divergent series? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I plotted this, uh, this graph. And for the moment, this was just a heuristic. Like imagine that this red thing was actually a function. Then it would look like this, say. And I, don't know how to, I don't know how to plot something that I imagine as a function. Yeah, I know. So what I've done is actually plot the solutions of the equation. Yeah, so, so this, uh, this red curve is exactly this uh, this function uh, here, which I've written down. Got Does it. Thanks. Sense? Any other questions? Okay. Um, so uh, so this gives us uh, so kind of some of the series, at least for positive x. You see, we need x to be positive in order that this uh, exponential e to the minus t over x decays as t goes to plus infinity so that the integral converges. And so now we have to ask the question, well, how do I see what's going on when x is negative? So I, I somehow want to say that this function is equal to this uh, this uh, Laplace transform when x is negative, um, but uh, the series now the integral diverges, so it doesn't really make sense. So what we should do instead is an analytic continuation. So instead of thinking of x as a real variable, we continue it into the complex plane. And uh, well, how can we do that? Well, th this function f is now defined by this integral. And I could just act, take x to be a complex parameter instead of a real parameter. And then you just observe that this integral, as I said, it converges as long as this exponential uh, decays as t goes to infinity. So for that to happen, what we need really is that the real part of uh, t over x is positive. And so we're going along the positive real axis. That just means that the real part of x is positive. So, um, so now what we can do is, is analytically continue by, uh, by uh, varying the contour. So now we've got it defined in the whole right half plane. And now let's continue uh, even further. So what we're going to do is take a Laplace transform, which I'm calling L sub theta, uh, not in the direction of the positive real axis, but let me integrate along some ray in the complex plane which starts at zero and goes off to infinity in some direction with angle theta. And so it's uh, very similar to the Laplace transform. It's just that I'm integrating in a different direction in the plane. Uh, but it always, the integrand is the same. I have this, uh, this function, one over one plus t, whose Laplace transform I'm taking. So this is the definition of the Laplace transform in the direction theta rather than along the positive real axis. And so I'll call the function that I get in this way f sub theta. And uh, the same reasoning applies. Uh, this integral will converge as long as this exponential is decaying 
as t goes to infinity along this array. So um, it's uh, good to draw a picture. So we start with a, the positive real axis as our range of integration. And when we do that, uh, the domain uh, on which the function is defined is the right half plane. So that's what I've shaded in gray here. And now what we can do is start uh, varying the angle of this array. So I move it up into the upper half plane. And now I need to take all the functions x, uh, all the points x such that uh, if I take a t along this ray, then t over x has a positive real part. So what I get is, is this uh, half plane where the boundary is perpendicular to the ray. Yeah, I continue in this way. I keep moving the ray, I get these other half planes. Right. Or similarly, I could have moved through the lower half plane for my ray. I get all these uh, half planes in the, in the variable x. OK. Any questions about this, uh, this construction of the Laplace transform in different directions? Could, could I ask something? Are, are we supposed to be thinking? Naively, that these are independent of theta by continuing by by completing this two different rays into a little sector, into a little triangle or something. That's right. I'm going to going to get to that in a minute. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, but before I cover that issue, um, I want to point out one other thing, uh, which is that there is one problem with this procedure. Uh, which is that the integrand e to the minus tx over one plus t, it has a pole exactly when t is equal to minus one, so along the negative real axis. So this causes a problem when I try to take the Laplace transform with the angle theta being equal to pi, so that I'm going along the negative real axis. You see, there's some kind of ambiguity. Like I could have approached the the negative real axis from above, like in this picture. Or I could have approached it from below, like in this picture. I would have had two slightly different uh, half planes for x, but they're definitely overlapping. And so now we see that there could be some ambiguity in the sum. And um, so what we should do is try to compare uh, the, two, uh, the two sums. So if I take the sum slightly above the axis and I compare it with the sum slightly below the axis, then, uh, well, I can think of it as the difference between the integral as I go above and integral as I go below. So that's like integrating along the negative real axis and just hopping around the pole, uh, either above or below. So that's these two contours, gamma minus and gamma plus. And what I care about is not the value of those individual integrals, but rather their difference. That's the discrepancy in the sum. And so uh, by the residue theorem, that's just uh, the residue of this function at the pole, t equals minus 1. Well, uh, the residue is very simple. It's just uh, e to the 1 over x. And so what I get is that the, the sum has jumped by this amount, 2 by i times e to the 1 over x. And as you'll recall, e to the 1 over x was exactly the solution of the homogeneous equation. Now, of course, it has to be, because if these, uh, these two functions, f pi minus and f pi plus, are going to be solutions of our ODE, then their difference has to be a solution of the homogeneous equation. So uh, uh, in a sense, it was obvious that we would have to get a multiple of e to the 1 over x. But the thing that I want to point out is that uh, even if you didn't know about the ODE that you were trying to solve, uh, this, this function, e to the 1 over x, would naturally pop out just by comparing the two sums of this series, forgetting about the fact that they came from an ODE. Okay. So in other words, um, this e to the 1 over x is somehow actually encoded in the divergent series itself, even though, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's a different function somehow. OK, so, um, so uh, let me then discuss uh, Borel, trans, uh, Borel summation as a, as a general procedure. So this, uh, 
as I said, is due to Emile Borel at the turn of the 20th century. And it works in the following way. We've, we've sort of seen it in this example now. So, uh, so what you do is uh, you are considering power series in a variable x. Uh, I'm going to assume there is no constant term. But uh, anyways, that's not a, not a big constraint. Um, and so the, what you can do is uh, take your series and somehow uh, turn it into a series in the variable t just by taking the, uh, the terms and dividing the coefficients by n factorial. So um, that's called the formal Borel transform of the series. It's just a purely, purely uh, linear algebra operation on formal power series. And its inverse is the thing that sends t to the n to n factorial x to the n plus 1. So you could think of that as like a formal power series version of the Laplace transform. And then the other ingredient that we have is this uh, Laplace transform in the direction theta in the complex plane. So that's for any function of t defined as the integral f of t e to the minus t over x along the ray with angle theta. So these are the ingredients that we need. So the definition of the Borel sum of the series, we start with a formal power series in the variable x. And you have to choose a direction of theta in the, in the complex plane. So theta is an element of S1. And the Borel sum f sub theta is a function of x. And it's given by taking your series which is a series in X, applying the Borel transform to get a series in the variable T, call that BF. And now you think of that as an actual function of T and you apply the honest integration Laplace transform. So what you get at the end of the day is this expression. Uh, you start with a series, um, you divide its coefficients by n factorial, you get a series which you hope converges and has an analytic continuation along this entire ray such that uh, this integral here converges. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that this is going to work. But uh, when it does, you say that the, the, the series is Borel summable in this direction. Um, uh, and uh, for instance, for this to work, you need to, first of all, have this analytic continuation along the whole ray. And then for the integral to converge, you need uh, the Borel transform to have somehow at most exponential growth at infinity so that as long as x is small enough, uh, this exponential will swamp the growth of the Borel transform and the integral will converge. And uh, it's a straightforward exercise to, to confirm that if you started with a series f that actually has a positive radius of convergence, so it converges in some disk, then um, the Borel transform, this function of t, actually is an entire function. It's defined on the whole complex plane, and it grows at most exponentially, so that the Borel sum in any direction is defined, and it always agrees with the ordinary sum of the series, like you learn in the first analysis course. So from that point of view, the Borel sum is a, a strict generalization of, uh, of the ordinary summation of power series. Any questions about the definition? OK. So let me uh, give a few properties of the summation. So um, when, uh, when the Borel sum f sub theta exists, um, well, it's, it's defined in a, a sector, which is centered at x equals 0 and has opening angle pi. So rather than a disk, you get a smaller open set, which looks uh, something like this, some kind of half disk. Okay. And, uh, and the, the angle which subdivides the sector is exactly the angle theta along which you're integrating. So just like uh, in that one example, we had these half planes where, uh, whose boundary was perpendicular to the, the direction of integration. Okay. 
Okay, and uh, once again, uh, the Borel sum will always be asymptotic to the formal power series. So this uh, function is equal to the uh, truncation of the series modulo terms of the next order as, uh, as x goes to zero in the domain of this Borel transform, uh, of this Borel sum. So, uh, so the series is a very good approximation for this function, it just doesn't converge. And, uh, and moreover, this, this Borel summation is compatible with various natural algebraic operations. So uh, I guess it should be pretty clear that it's a linear operation. So if I take the sum of two series and then Borel sum them, I'll get the sum uh, of the Borel sums. A bit less obvious is that it's also compatible with multiplication. So it's a ring homomorphism. And uh, this is tied up with the fact that uh, the Laplace transform also has a compatibility with multiplication. You recall that uh, the Laplace transform interchanges ordinary multiplication of functions with a kind of convolution product on functions. So uh, making use of that, you can see that the Borel sum is an algebra homomorphism. And uh, it's also compatible with differentiation. So if I take the derivative of the Borel sum, that's the Borel sum of the derivative of the formal power series, term by term. So uh, these three things together, they tell you that if you were to ever start with F, a formal power series, which is a solution of some polynomial ordinary differential equation, if you take the Borel sum of that series, then you'll get an honest solution of this equation. Okay, so now I want to come to this issue uh, about the uh, dependence on theta. Okay. So in order to uh, phrase it precisely, I need the following definition. So um, a direction theta in the complex plane is called a singular direction for our formal power series if the series cannot be Borel summed in this direction. Okay, so so with our example of the Euler series, uh, the Borel transform, it had this pole at t is equal to minus one. We tried to integrate along the negative real axis. We hit the pole. So the integral doesn't converge. And what we get is a singular direction. So that's the only singular direction for that example. So now if you take, um, <clears throat> take an interval in the circle uh, of these possible thetas, take an open interval, which contains no singular directions, then what you find just by deforming the contour, the contour invariant, uh, deformation invariance of the contour integral, you'll see that um, uh, the Borel sums in the directions theta and theta primes are equal on their common domain. So in other words, you can somehow glue them together to get a sum which is actually defined on an even bigger sector. So here's my cartoon picture. Um, so uh, here I have a dark, dark blue ray going off to infinity in some direction. And I have this uh, semicircle, which is the domain where the Borel sum in that direction converges. Okay. And uh, these red crosses are some uh, singularities of the Borel transform of the series which I have to avoid when I want to compute these integrals. So now I can take this ray, which I've got at dark blue, and I can imagine wiggling it so that uh, its angle goes between the angle of these two singular points. And, and that gives me an open interval of possible angles, which I called i. And so it has some length, absolute value of i. And as I sweep the, uh, this ray through this sector, I get a bunch of semicircles which overlap. Uh, the uh, clockwise most one has a boundary here and the counterclockwise most one has a boundary here. 
And so uh, the Borel sums agree on, on their overlap. And what I get is a sum which is defined on this uh, larger kind of Pac-Man shaped sector. Okay. The opening angle is now bigger than pi. And uh, the reason this is a good thing to do is that um, it fixes an issue which I had swept under the rug before, um, which is uh, about this asymptotic expansion. So I have this asymptotic expansion in my, uh, my semi-disk. I could easily add a function to f theta, like e to the uh, minus 1 over x, uh, which uh, was vanishing very rapidly, faster than any polynomial, and that would not change the asymptotic expansion. So this, uh, this sum f theta is by no means the unique function with this asymptotic expansion, okay? However, if, uh, if we slightly enlarge the sector so that the angle has, uh, the opening angle is bigger than pi, then there's this theorem of Watson, which tells us that the Borel sum is somehow the unique sum of the series in a suitable sense. So more precisely, let's take a, an interval of these non-singular directions, an open interval, then uh, this glued sum, this Borel sum over this uh, larger interval, it's the unique function on its domain, which has the following properties. So first of all, it's an analytic function away from x equals zero. And uh, moreover, it's asymptotic to the formal power series f as x goes to zero in this uh, enlarged sector. So just like before. Um, and the, the remaining thing which makes it unique is the, the property called uh, being of Givray class, um, which is a bound on the growth rate of the derivatives of this function. And so uh, more precisely, it, it has the following property so if I look at the absolute value of the nth derivative of this function, and I take a supremum on some compact subsector, then uh, it grows like some constant to the power n times n factorial squared as n goes to infinity. So the higher and higher order derivatives I get, they, they are never bigger than m to the n n factorial squared. So this is, um, this is something close to saying that the, the Taylor expansion uh, of this function, it has coefficients that don't grow too rapidly. They're only like doubly factorial. So, uh, so this enlarged uh, Borel sum is the unique sum of the series uh, with these three properties. It's analytic, has the series as its asymptotic expansion, and it doesn't grow too fast. Any questions? Okay, so the Stokes phenomenon, um, which uh, as I said, was discovered by Stokes uh, in the 19th century when he was studying the Airy function. Um, so it's the property that the asymptotics jump as we cross a singular direction. So singular direction is where we can't take the Borel sum. So, so now imagine, in addition to that, uh, that one region where we were taking the sum before, we have another region next to it, which is this green one. Um, so uh, taking the Borel sum in either of these regions will give me functions that are defined on these kind of Pac-Man shapes. So I have the blue one, which I had before, and now I have the green one corresponding to this region here. And they have some overlap, which, uh, which I've drawn. And, uh, and so on the overlap, we, we do a calculation similar to what we did before to get the discrepancy between the Borel sum above the singularity and below the singularity. So as an example, uh, similar to what we did already, if you have a situation where the Borel transform has a pole along this, this uh, singular direction and uh, no other singularities, then, uh, well, the difference between the green sum and the blue sum is given by, uh, well, the difference between the green integral and the blue integral. So that's like uh, 
coming in from infinity to zero along the blue curve and out along the green curve. So uh, that's by the residue theorem. Uh, it's just the residue of this uh, Borel transform at the singular point t naught times this uh, this exponential. Okay. So uh, so in that way we get uh, get some kind of exponentially small difference between these two sums. Um, now, when you extend this uh, Borel transform to the complex plane, there's no reason a priori why it has to be single valued. Um, so for instance, you could have a point, a singular point where there's some kind of logarithmic branching of this function. And so then when you compare the integral along the blue curve and the green curve, you're actually comparing two different branches of this uh, function B of F. So then what you get is something like this, the difference of the green and blue sums is equal to uh, an expression, which is like the Borel sum um, of a different thing given by taking the Laplace transform of the difference of the two branches of this Borel transform. So you go out to infinity along this, this ray here, you compare the two branches, you take their difference and you integrate that and that gives the answer. So depending on which type of singularities you have, uh, you know, you may have a different formula for the jump. And of course, it could well be the case that you have many, many singularities along a single ray, in which case you have to count for all of them somehow as you uh, compute this difference, but uh, hopefully this gives some idea. So uh, this leads us to a Cal's theory of resurgence, which is a, a general theory um, kind of encapsulating many of the things that we've seen now. So uh, it begins with the definition of a resurgent power series. So a formal power series is resurgent, roughly speaking, if it can be Borel summed in most directions. So more precisely, um, here's, a, here's a definition, although there are um, other conventions and levels of generality that you might consider. So series, uh, power series F is called resurgent if its Borel transform, which is a series in T, it extends to an analytic function of T on the, the whole complex plane, except maybe some isolated singularities uh, and it could be multi-valued. So more precisely, it's allowed to live on some possibly infinite sheeted branched covering of the complex plane. And uh, that branched covering, it will of course depend on this function f, uh, whatever this uh, Riemann surface for this function b of f is, that's your branched covering. But the key thing is that on the branched covering, it only has isolated singularity. And then finally, um, you need to know, in order to compute these uh, Laplace transforms, you need to know that as you go out along a ray, uh, this uh, B of F has at most exponential growth. But now when we talk about going out on a ray, we have to say which sheet of the Riemann surface of this function we're going out along. So what we want is that the, the, uh, the uh, function B of F has at most exponential growth as we go, go to infinity along any sheet of this Riemann surface. So this, uh, this basically guarantees that uh, for most directions, you can find a ray and uh, just compute the Borel sum. And in light of the Stokes phenomenon, that, uh, that the different sums can differ by exponential, exponentially small corrections, uh, we ought to try to include those also in our formalism. So uh, that's the notion of a, a trans series. This is an idea that you take a power series and also add to it some exponential terms. So the definition of a resurgent trans series is that you have a possibly infinite formal sum like this, uh, fi e to the minus ti over x, where each of these fi's is one of these resurgent power series. 
And then uh, each of these TIs is a complex number. So the idea is that you, you want to uh, you want to have a space of uh, series or functions where you can do all of the operations that we've just been talking about, and that's supposed to be these resurgent trend series. So um, these uh, these series they form an algebra. So uh, on the space of all these series, it's a very large infinite dimensional space. Uh, but anyways, it has a ring structure we can, we can add and multiply, and we can also differentiate. So it's what's sometimes called a differential algebra. And uh, we have a notion of Borel summation, uh, where we just take the Borel sum of these uh, individual series Fi by, as I said, lifting the ray of integration to the Riemann surface of this function. And then uh, you can encode the Stokes phenomenon uh, in the following way. So what, what you see is that this algebra of resurgent series carries a unique automorphism, S theta for any theta, with the following property. If I take the Borel sum of the series uh, just below theta, that's equal to the Borel sum of, the, of a different series, which is the one I get by taking the series and applying some automorphism to it. So for instance, in our, in our case of the Euler equation, we had, uh, we had this uh, formal power series. And when we crossed array, we added to it an exponential correction. So adding that exponential correction is an operation in the space of all these trend series. And that's what the Stokes automorphism does in that particular case. And um, this, uh, this automorphism S theta is, is quite nice. It's a unipotent operator. So it's very nearly the identity. And then uh, it adds things somehow of uh, a higher exponential order. So uh, this is uh, encoding the fact that the sum, difference of the sums is always exponentially smaller than the functions themselves. Now, one of the, the nice things, if you have a unipotent operator, then uh, it must be the exponential of, uh, of something. Just like if you have an upper triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal, it's always the exponential of a, of a nilpotent matrix. So, uh, so this unipotent operator is the exponential of some uh, operator delta sub theta. And because S theta is an algebra automorphism, this uh, logarithm delta theta must be a derivation of the algebra. So it satisfies the Leibniz rule. And, uh, and for that reason, Ekel refers to this as the, uh, the alien derivative, the uh, derivé étranger, uh, because it's different from the operator d by dx. It's some other derivation on this algebra, uh, which involves these exponential corrections. And so you can't see it uh, just as an ordinary derivative with respect to x. It's kind of a strange, uh, strange operation. Um, but one of the amazing things about this uh, way of setting up the, the formalism is the following. So, so the, one thing that's important to realize is that if you have one of these series, uh, where say fi, these power series, and ti, the exponents, are real numbers, then uh, you could try to take the Borel sum along the positive real axis. Everything in sight is real, and so you would hope that you would get a real valued answer. And that's definitely true if there are no singularities along the positive real axis. But when there is a singularity, you have a problem because the Borel sum is not defined. And so now you, you're curious whether you can still assign some kind of real valued sum to this series. Um, so uh, the amazing thing is that this, uh, 
there's a universal procedure for doing this. Uh, and it's a kind of uh, complicated way of averaging over all possible contours going off to infinity in the positive direction where you go along the axis and you make a little jog around each of the singular points. Okay. So I could jog above one of them and then below the next one and above the next one and below the next one or you know, whatever, uh, whatever sequence of uh, detours you want to make that gives a valid contour going off to infinity. And you take a kind of weighted average of all of these sums and what you get is a real valued solution. So the, the way that this is expressed succinctly is, is by this theorem of Eichel, which says that if you, if you take um, these real trans series, um, then the Borel sum of the series that you get by taking W and applying the square root of the Stokes operator, uh, that will, uh, give you a real valued solution, a real valued sum, when you uh, take the, take the uh, Borel sum in the, in the theta equals zero direction. Okay. So th this Stokes operator, remember, it tells you the difference between the, uh, the uh, sum below and above your singular direction. And what this theorem says is that somehow if you go halfway through the singularity by taking the square root of S instead of S itself, you get a, get a series that you can, you can sum and, and get a real answer. Quite remarkable. So this is, this is uh, one of the reasons why resurgence uh, has been, I think, uh, of interest in physics. Often there you have a, a physical problem and you really want to get a real number at the other end. And uh, you encounter this problem with the singularities of the Borel, the Borel transform. And so you need uh, a more subtle way of getting a real valued answer. Okay, so um, in the last few minutes, I, I just want to speak about one application of this formalism that will be used in, in Tom Bridgeland's talk, talks, uh, which is the uh, classification of meromorphic connections. So I want to consider an ODE for a vector valued function y of x of the following forms. dy by dx is a, a matrix a of x over x squared times the vector y. And so this uh, A is a k by k matrix of holomorphic functions. And more invariantly, I could think of having a pair E, five, uh, e nabla, excuse me, uh, consisting of a, a rank k holomorphic vector bundle E on some Riemann surface and a meromorphic connection nabla having a second order pole. So this phi should have been a nabla. Okay, so locally, such a thing exactly uh, looks like the ODE above. So uh, if I have a connection, then I can always write it in a local trivialization as D minus a one form, matrix valued one form. And now I allow that matrix valued one form to have a second order pole. And then the ODE up here is just uh, the equation for a section of this bundle to be a flat section, nabla y is equal to zero, covariant constant. So the, the goal is to uh, classify uh, germs of such pairs, E nabla, up to holomorphic gauge equivalents. So connection nabla is considered equivalent to uh, nabla prime. If I can find a holomorphic and invertible transformation, uh, linear transformation, which uh, conjugates nabla prime to nabla. So it's just the usual notion of gauge equivalents for connections, but the connections have poles. So uh, the strategy for, uh, for solving this problem, well, maybe before that, are, are there any questions about the, the statement of the problem? Okay, so um, the strategy uh, to solve the problem we're going to do it only in a simple ca simplest case, which is where the leading term of this uh, matrix function is regular semi-simple. Um, so in other words, uh, the connection uh, has a leading term, which is given by a diagonal matrix 
whose eigenvalues are distinct, pairwise distinct. And then I have terms, maybe I have a polar of order, uh, you know, a term of order one over X and then some holomorphic stuff. So we make this simplifying assumption and then we try to solve this equation uh, nabla y is equal to zero uh, by first uh, simplifying the connection itself, trying to reduce it to a diagonal one. So right now I have a diagonal matrix as a leading term. I might, might try to diagonalize the whole thing in which case it becomes easy to solve the equation. So, um, so what I'd like to do is reduce it to an, a connection of this form it just has uh, two terms, uh, the one over x squared term, the one over x term, they're both diagonal matrices. And the point is that if I can do that, then I can write down the uh, solutions very easily. Um, it's a diagonal system, so all of the components, they just decouple and I get to just directly integrate them and I get these, uh, these kind of functions, e to the minus t1 over x1, x to the power of lambda 1, and so on. So that's uh, the general solution. Okay, and so the strategy for trying to reduce uh, our complicated connection to the simpler one is just to find a formal power series gauge transformation that does the job. Just like when we solve the Euler equation, we're just gonna look for a uh, formal power series phi, which starts with the identity, and then it has higher order terms, giving me uh, a GLK matrix uh, whose entries are formal power series in X. Uh, and then I want to I want this uh, this uh, gauge transformation to do the job so that it conjugates NABLA zero to NABLA. Okay. So um, you just uh, just take this equation, uh, stick in this ansatz, and you'll you'll realize that um, in fact there's a unique formal power series that does the job. So, um, so then uh, we've, uh, we've related to this uh, complicated connection to the simple one. So we can relate the solutions of the simple one to the solutions of the complicated one. So we want to write down a fundamental solution for the equation nabla y equals zero. We put, it, put the vector uh, basis of solutions into the columns of a matrix. And that should look like this gauge transformation times the solutions of the simple diagonal equation. And now um, what happens, of course, is that this uh, gauge transformation phi, it was only a formal power series. And in general, that formal power series will diverge. Uh, but anyway, it turns out to be Borel summable in most directions. The only directions where you can't sum it are the ones which are given by the angle theta is equal to the arguments of the difference of these exponents ti and tj. So, for any pair i and j, you can, you can look at this argument that gives a array in the complex plane. And those are the singular arrays uh, where you can't sum series. And then um, as we've seen, if you compare the series, uh, you can compare the sum of the series on either side of these rays. So theta ij plus and theta ij minus, um, rather than taking their difference, let me take their multiplicative difference. So uh, the, the plus one times the inverse of the minus one, they're both invertible matrices, and call that S of theta. Well, um, you can uh, convince yourself that this turns out to be an upper triangular or lower triangular matrix, depending on whether I is bigger than or less than J. So you get a matrix, which is uh, very simple. It has uh, the identity, uh, the ones along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, except in the entry ij. And uh, so these, uh, these matrices are uh, unipotent matrices and they're called the Stokes data of the connection NABLA. They encode the failure of the solutions to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to glue, or in other words, the, the failure of this uh, series to be, conver um, yeah, to be convergent. Um, and just because uh, for each i and j, you've got a different entry in the matrix, if you multiply them all together in the right order, 
then you can you can uh, think of the collection of them all as forming the space u plus cross u minus of upper triangular matrices times lower triangular matrices. Sorry, not times, but uh, pairs of upper and lower triangular matrices. So this leads uh, to the classification data. So this is a theorem uh, of Balser, Yukat, and Lutz. Uh, it says the following. So in our situation, we had a pairwise distinct collection of these numbers t1 up to tk, which were the exponents in those exponentials. Um, then the procedure that we just followed of, uh, well, converting the, uh, the connection to a diagonal one using a formal transformation, then we get uh, this one over x term, which had the eigenvalues lambda i. You can think of that as living a diagonal matrix living in the Cartan subalgebra of GLK. Um, and then uh, the remaining data is the Stokes data for each of these rays, which together form, uh, form uh, upper and lower triangular matrices. And then uh, the statement is that this, uh, this operation of extracting the Stokes data, it gives a bijection between uh, germs of meromorphic connections with this uh, diagonal matrix as the leading term, uh, modulo gauge equivalents, and uh, matrices, uh, upper triangular matrix, a lower triangular matrix, and a diagonal matrix considered up to overall conjugation by diagonal matrices. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's the classifying data, which will uh, be appearing in, in Tom's talks. Uh, maybe let me just make a few remarks on some generalizations. Uh, so of course, uh, you could consider the case where you have poles of order bigger than two. A similar phenomenon occurs. Um, you have exponential not of one over x, but of one over x squared, one over x cubed, and so on. So you end up getting more and more sectors in the complex plane to worry about, but you can manage it. So there's a generalization of this to higher order poles. Uh, it's been extended to the case uh, where the simplifying assumption is dropped. So the leading term is no longer diagonalizable with distinct eigenvalues. Um, you can replace the group GLK with an arbitrary reductive complex group and so on. Um, and really, uh, I think the definitive source for a lot of these uh, generalizations is the work of uh, Philip Bolch. Um, okay, so the last comment that I want to make um, is the following. So I want to observe that in this theorem of uh, Balser, Hirkat, and Lutz, um, the initial uh, uh, data that we picked was this uh, collection of, of pairwise distinct numbers, t1 up to tk. Okay, and the, the left-hand side of this equivalence, uh, it depends on those numbers because I'm looking at connections which have that diagonal matrix as their leading term. Okay. But the right-hand side is just the space of upper triangular, lower triangular, and diagonal matrices. So the right-hand side, it, it doesn't see these coefficients t1 up to tk, it doesn't know about them. So as I vary these t's, I, I'll get, uh, get this family of isomorphisms between, on the left-hand side, a varying family of moduli problems, and on the right-hand side, this very simple algebraic variety. And uh, so there's a problem called the isomonodromy or isostokes problem, which is, uh, is to ask, well, if, can I vary the connection nabla as a function of the t's, keeping the Stokes data stuff on the right-hand side fixed. And uh, in light of this bijection, the answer must be yes. And the solution of this problem uh, is, is you should choose this connection nabla to solve a certain PDE, which can be expressed geometrically by saying that uh, I, I take the, the T dependent connection nabla to be the restriction of a flat connection on a larger manifold, which is the total space uh, not just of the Riemann surface X, but also um, these uh, parameters T. So when you do that, uh, uh, what you get is a, a family of connections depending on uh, parameter T, which has the property that the Stokes data are constant. Okay. So, um, 
this, uh, this leads to the PDE, which will appear in, in Bridgeland's lectures, um, uh, interpreting uh, some earlier work of Dominic Joyce. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you again for the invitation. I'm really, really pleased to be participating. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. Uh, perhaps we can clap virtually or physically. Uh, and I open the floor to questions. Do unmute yourself. Um, want to ask a question? Yeah, I have a short question, uh, sort of, uh, did anybody try to define uh, resurgent functions of several variables? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not really an expert in the field, so uh, I'm not up to date on the latest. Sorry about that. Okay. Could I ask something? Uh, Brent, uh, that was an amazing talk. Thank you. Um, if you, when you Borel summed that your original power series for this Euler equation, yes, was that somehow a distinguished solution better than all the others? Uh, yeah. So let me go back to the beginning where I had that picture. Um, So um, let's talk about the Borel sum in the positive real direction, okay? So along uh, this region. If you, if you look at the solutions, you see they all have the form of uh, this red solution plus this function e to the one over x, which is blowing up. So oh, yeah. amongst all of the infinitely many solutions of this equation on the right-hand side of the diagram, exactly one of them does not blow up at x equals zero. And that one mm -hmm. is the Borel sum of the series. And is that something that appears in other examples or that's something special? No, that, that's, uh, that's the general situation. So the, uh, the point is that the Borel sum, it always has this power series as an asymptotic expansion. So the function, it always looks like, um, The Borel sum, it will always look like, uh, it will always look almost like a smooth function in the sense that it's very well approximated by a polynomial of arbitrary order. And so, in particular, it does not blow up to infinity as you approach uh, zero in that direction. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, but, but then you see as you analytically continue, this property can break. So, yeah. so once we got around to, um, to this situation here where the angle was equal to pi, um, now, now you have a problem uh, because the, these uh, series, they now have this exponential uh, appearing. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so maybe better to say like, I could have started with a Borel sum over here and continued it and ended up with a solution that was uh, blowing up exponentially on the other side. Yeah, so yeah, that's great. if I started with anything other than uh, that particular Borel sum um, and I analytically continued it, then I would end up with, um, then I'd end up with one of those uh, solutions uh, that was uh, blowing up. Right. I can take any one of these blue curves and analytically continue it. It will give me one of the blue curves on the right-hand side and blow up. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions uh, before we stop the recording? Can oh, I have one part. Yeah. Right. Is there somebody else? Oh, two of us. You go first. Um, I was just wondering whether there was anything you could say about Eckhal's sort of motivation for thinking about this. I've never had the opportunity to speak to Eckhal, so um, I have to say I'm not sure what was in his mind when he was uh, when he was doing this. I think uh, one of the applications which he considered 
was a problem in dynamics about uh, um, certain foliations uh, and their local normal form, which he, which he solved using these methods. Um, but uh, but uh, I guess for now we know that there are many more applications, but I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know exactly what was in his mind at the time. Okay, then I'll ask my question. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, I saw in your lecture notes that you also have some quantum mechanical examples. Could you comment on the physical interpretation of the alien derivative and um, the Stokes automorphism for some simple quantum mechanical system? Um, well, uh, probably won't have much uh, physically relevant to say, but one of the one of the interesting examples of this, uh, this formalism is when you consider the WKB approximation. You, you try to solve the Schrodinger equation, say in one dimension, uh, and now uh, the expansion parameter is Planck's constant h bar, not the, not the variable where your ODE lives. And uh, typically what happens is uh, you get exactly this kind of uh, divergent series which uh, can only be resummed using these uh, resurgent techniques. And, uh, and, and one of the things which, uh, which this explains kind of conceptually is, is a paper of Bender and Wu, where they were looking at the, was the quartic and harmonic oscillator. And, um, and they discovered uh, some interesting structure of the, the energy spectrum, which is that when you, when you analytically continue an H bar, the different discrete energy levels are actually related by uh, analytic continuation. So you, they are somehow living on different sheets of the same Riemann surface. Um, so that was, uh, that was one of the, uh, the interesting observations. But um, I, guess, uh, I guess one of the other things that uh, I hope we'll hear a bit more about in, in Marino's talk is, uh, is when you have cer certain perturbative expansions in QFT, um, these exponential corrections that are occurring, they somehow correspond to instantons in the theory. Um, so somehow this perturbative expansion seems to know about other instantons, even though you're expanding around one of them. I don't know, I, I hope that goes some way to answering your question, it was a bit vague. Yeah, great, thanks. There's maybe one other one which was just a bit the bit at the end of the Eckhart stuff about uh, sort of averaging over different contours. I mean, to, so there's some choices in the way you do that. So, I mean, there's not some unique. That's right. So let me uh, let me just pull up the statement so that we're. Uh... Sorry, I have, I have a few too many slides, so it's uh, it's slow to go through them. Here it is, okay. Right, so um, so remember the goal was uh, you want to take a sum along the real axis and obtain a real answer. And uh, the solution is to average over all of these contours which go off to infinity, dodging the different singular points. And uh, of course, you're right. Uh, in principle, there could, you know, this, this Riemann surface could have infinitely many sheets. So there could be infinitely many of these different contours dodging the singularities in different ways. So, uh, so the key thing about Eckhall's construction is that it tells you the weight that you should assign to each one of these paths. Okay. So each one of them is assigned a specific weight such that when you add up over all of them, what you get at the end of the day is a real valued sum of the series. Okay. And the, the way that he expresses that rather than telling you exactly what coefficients for the function is in terms of this automorphism S. So the Stokes automorphism, it tells you how, uh, how the uh, Borel sum changes, uh, you know, just by expressing it as a formula, an operation on these trans series. And that operation has a square root, which uh, when you unpack everything, uh, amounts to uh, taking a sum over many, many different contours. Um, so, uh, 
whether this is the unique solution of the problem, I'm not sure, but it's a canonical solution, if that makes sense. And again, this, this, like your earlier things, then this is, even if something arises from an ODE, then the procedure is then sort of decoupled from the actual ODE. Yeah, exactly. So that, that, that's somehow the point is that this, this whole formalism is decoupled from the origin of the series. It doesn't matter if it came from an ODE or the WKB expansion or some quantum field theory problem, it doesn't matter where it came from you apply the same recipe. It's, it's purely something about series. And then, uh, but uh, are there also results saying that you can find formal solutions of ODEs among trans series or? Uh, um... uh, oh yes, so, um, so for instance, um, in this example that I was looking at where you have a, a mirror-morphic connection with a pole of some order, then uh, you can always find solutions in trend series. But, um, but I guess, uh, you know, that's going to depend somewhat on the specific details of, of what class of ODEs you're looking at. Of course, there, there are going to be ODEs that have solutions that don't have this kind of uh, asymptotic behavior. Right? But, uh, but various properties like a pole of certain order, for instance, will be enough to guarantee the trans series solution. Well, you're always thinking here of linear. That was for linear ones, yeah, but uh, but one can also analyze nonlinear equations. So when I uh, when I alluded to um, that work that Ikal was doing about um, foliations, it was about foliations in the plane, and you could think of those as as really being some nonlinear ODEs. Yeah, I mean, he was trying to prove the finiteness of the number of limit cycles or same problem. Uh, right. Well, there was also some uh, some classification that he obtained. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, maybe maybe we can break there. Um, the next Tom's Tom's first lecture is in just over 10 minutes. <laughs>